Hello, Magic Community on YouTube. I'm T1 Glistener Elf, here with a quick little vlog video for you. I've been watching other YouTubers, MTG YouTubers, talk about the relatively recent, I guess by now it's still recent, buyouts of a number of cards. Craig Berry with Moat and Lion's Eye Diamond uh, as of recording this, and Martin Screlly with some Black Lotuses, five last I heard. And I wanted to talk about what this issue is, why it matters, and my take on it. So for those that don't know, we're going to start off with... Actually, we're going to start off with Martin Screlly, because that's easy. Martin Screlly, Google that guy's name. <laughs> um, he is infamous for raising the price of a drug that was needed for saving patients' lives, HIV patients. And so, that notwithstanding, what we care about for the purpose of this conversation is that he went out to buy uh, Black Lotuses. And granted, that's a really expensive card, so buying that out is hard, but we are talking about someone who has millions of dollars. So, that is a problem, but I don't think that it's a problem to the same extent as what happened with Craig Berry. And I don't mean to say that Craig Berry is a worse person. Don't get me wrong on that. I definitely don't think that. Um, but Craig Berry went and bought, en masse, Moat and Lion's Eye Diamond. Now, neither of those cards are all that played, at least not, you know, in most people's casual EDH groups. They're not modern legal or standard legal or anything like that. They are played in Legacy and Vintage. Well, I don't know, actually, I don't know about Moat and Vintage. But definitely in Legacy. You see it in Enchantress mainboards and Miracle's sideboards. Lion's Eye Diamond is actually key for a number of decks. You need it. If you want to play Tess or Ant, if you want to play Dredge in Legacy, then you need Lion's Eye Diamond. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's a requirement. Now, that being the case, the reason that this is so important that these cards were bought out is because, well, that raises the price. That raises the floor for the cards now. And let me explain why this works the way that it does. See, if you're... most cards, that doesn't work that way, right? I mean, it still can, but there's a bit of a catch. So, there is something in Magic called the Reserve List. And a Reserve List means that the cards featured on that list are never going to be printed again Kind of. I mean, they are online. That's the thing. And they are allowed, I think, to be reprinted as promotional cards, I think is an exception, but certainly not en masse. Um, they actually experimented with, say, Karn Silver Golem, for instance, as a... Uh, from the Vault card, and some people didn't like that too much, so they uh, went back and said they're not going to do that again. If you're on the reserve list, that means that the supply of you can never go up. It can go down, of course, as cards are destroyed or brought into worse and worse condition, but it can never go up. If I want to invest in, say, Tarmogoyf, well, okay, that's a expensive card, and it's certainly something that people need to play, right? Well, not, not every deck needs Tarmogoyf, but a lot of decks do. And yet, I know that Tarmogoyf can get reprinted, and in fact it has, twice. Granted, neither of those were uh, very extensive print runs. Modern Masters 1 and 2 were both pretty limited, and admittedly, that's somewhat the point. But at least there's a chance that Tarmogoyf gets reprinted, and the slightly greater supply decreases the price a little bit. In the case of the reserve list, that can't happen. So as long as demand stays stable or goes up, you're going to see the card's price get higher and higher, because the supply simply dwindles. The supply of available moats now has dwindled so much that the floor for the card is much higher than it used to be. That's what a buyout is. So, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent and then come back to this. Uh, there's another game that I like to play. Uh, it's another trading card game called Yu-Gi-Oh! You may have heard of this before. And I don't want to get into a which game is better argument. I doesn't matter for the purpose of this conversation. What does is actually a difference 
not between the games themselves, but between the companies. Uh, Wizards of the Coast versus Konami. They have taken radically different approaches. See, the reason that the reserve list exists at all is because, in Magic's history, they came out with a set called Chronicles, which was basically the predecessor to Modern Masters, Eternal Masters, etc. Um, it was a reprint set. There were a lot of cards that people just didn't have enough of. They were rare enough. And in order to keep up with player demand, they made a reprint set. Sounds familiar. And collectors did not like this, because they saw the value of some cards go down. Okay, so how do you fix this? Well, I think, and a lot of people think, that Wizards of the Coast overcompensated by saying, look, we're going to make a reserve list. We promise, promise, promise these cards are never getting reprinted again, we swear, cross our hearts. And, lo and behold, they've kept to that promise ever since. Again, notwithstanding Karn, Silver Golem, and whatnot. There was a similar situation that happened in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history. They had, back in 2004, in October I think it was, Dark Beginnings 1, which was their Chronicles. And, I don't know what this was like in the OCG, but in the TCG, people got mad. Exodia was a card, if you know nothing else about Yu-Gi-Oh!, you might still know Exodia. Uh, was a card that was in that reprint set, and collectors did not like that. And what did they do? Well, 41 weeks later, they came out with Dark Beginnings 2. They doubled down. And whatever you think about the game itself, Yu-Gi-Oh!, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, has more cards in circulation than Magic, and this is part of the reason why. Now, that does have its own problems, uh, if you gear the game away from collectors, then you make it a bad investment. And if you're trying to get into Yu-Gi-Oh! because you want an investment, spoiler alert, that's not a very good idea. They reprint the crap out of their cards. Absolutely. Magic the Gathering has the opposite problem. They don't reprint enough. Even when a card isn't on the reserve list. Unless it's really, really in demand. And even then, maybe not. <laughs> um... It's going to either get a limited print run in something like Modern Masters, it doesn't get printed at all, or occasionally you might see it show up in Standard, but they regretted cards like Thoughtseize and Mutavolp. Admittedly, those were somewhat format war warping, <laughs> even though I don't think that Thoughtseize was broken, it was definitely warping. And that's an important distinction. But back to MTG Finance. Corbin Hosler from blog.mtgprice.com conducted an interview with Craig Berry uh, and put an article with the interview on his website. Link in the description below. You should definitely check that out. It is an awesome read, I think. Uh, there are some quotes from it that I'd like to address. Uh, the first one is in response uh, to the question from Mr. Hostler. For Moat, that makes sense, the, the buyout, the logic behind it. What about Lion's Eye Diamond? a buyout that has priced some people out of playing Legacy. And this is his response. Quote, I don't look at magic as a game. I look at it as a business. And it's kind of like day trading. I feel bad for anyone priced out personally, but it's not going to change what the business is. It's just how the world works. End quote. I think that it's important to note here something that gets overlooked in discussions about buyouts, for instance. When you see someone make a comment like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person. I like to think of people to the extent that they operate as uh, traders, as investors, as businessmen and women. I like to think of them the same way that we think, in America at least, of corporations. A corporation has a fiduciary responsibility to make money for its shareholders. It has to do that. It has to make money. And as such, corporations can't really be moral entities. I mean, to the extent that they can be, it has to be in line with the mission of maximize profit for the shareholders. And I think that that's how Mr. Barry is. I don't think that he's a bad person. I mean, 
I, I take his word when he says that he's doing this in part because he has a family to raise and he wants to take care of them, provide for them. I get that. Uh, I have a young child myself, too, so I can certainly understand that. That being the case, there is a business interest that he's actually pretty explicitly putting over the community interest. And that's something that Mr. Hostler addresses in his My Take section. He says, I choose community over capitalism. What about you? And this is part of the reason why I can't make myself invest in the same way. I can't do it. If I know that a card is only going to go up, at least until demand goes down because no one can play the format or the game anymore because the price is so high, until we get to that point, the price keeps going up on these. I know that, and I can't make myself buy these cards just for the sake of investing, because I know that every time that I take a card for myself, that's one card that someone else can't have. And, and to his credit, perhaps, Mr. Barry also addresses this in the article. He worries that, I'm paraphrasing here, he worries that, you know, he could just sit back and not spend the money, but that money's going to be spent regardless. He could buy the card himself, or someone else could buy it, but it's inevitable the way that he sees it, and to a large extent, he's probably right. He just wants it to be him if it's going to be anyone. You can call that selfish. I see it as rational, but I don't agree with that mentality, even though I certainly understand the logic behind it. He does make another quote here that I think is consequential for myself and those who are watching this. He says, The people who complain about prices don't affect the market. They weren't the ones who were going to spend money from the beginning. With Moat, I've never seen so many people complain about a card they were never going to buy. It's really easy to have trigger fingers and complain about something, but it doesn't affect the market. End quote. Alright, so... I, I don't think that he means it the way that it came out. Uh, with Moat, I've never seen so many people complain about a card that they were never going to buy. Of course, he can't know that, and if, if the price were lower, maybe they would actually end up buying it. But ignoring that point, perhaps that's reading a little bit too much into his exact words. I, to his general idea, it is not the case that people who complain about prices don't affect the market. I mean, there is some truth to that, right? By definition, if you're not spending money, you're not affecting the market, right? Well, no. That isn't exactly how that works. By not spending money, if you're doing it actively or inactively, you are making a choice that does affect the market. So, for example, um, he talks about a buyout on Rest in Peace that he made. Well, not a buyout. He didn't buy all the copies, but he bought a ton of copies. Rest in Peace is a really good card, and at the time, he bought it for less than a buck. And of course, it has gone up and up and up and up and up ever since then. He realized how much the card was worth and put his money where his mouth is, and went and bought them because he was speculating on something that he was sure was going to go up. So that's how it can work in one direction, of course. That's for people who do spend the money. But for people who don't spend the money, people who just complain, well, there's a number of ways that they can affect the market. The first is with what I like to call your virtual money, which is to say, not digital money, that's not what I mean. It's saying, act loudly enough, I would spend the money, but. In other words, you aren't spending the money, but you would spend the money if X. Hey, I want to get into modern, but there's not there aren't enough Tarmogoyfs for me. I would get into modern, I would buy the cards, your packs, but I need Tarmogoyfs, and lo and behold we get modern masters. Because they realize that there's that demand. So if you complain enough, that's raising awareness of demand. I don't know if Wizards of the Coast is legally allowed to get rid of the reserve list. It may be the case that they're not. Um, you know, the spiel, I'm not an attorney, yada yada yada. Uh, there may be some legal issue with that, some obstacle there. 
but if they are allowed to, you don't think that if there are enough of us saying that we will spend oodles and oodles of money that they wouldn't give in? No, assuming that they can get rid of the reserve list, they are constantly making a cost-benefit analysis. And so far, they've always decided that the cost outweighs the benefit. And so they've come up with their own workaround, and that is Magic Online for reprinting power, for instance. Another way that you can affect the market, and this one I definitely don't like, is by not playing the game. That's kind of sad. That's not where I want to be because I love magic. But it's true. If you want them to listen, you can walk away. I'm not saying do, but if enough people do, then they would listen. Now, it doesn't matter, pretty much, how many people walk away from Legacy or Vintage, and the reason for that is because they're not monetizing it. Right now, okay, I say that, Eternal Masters is out now, but at least as far as the reserve list goes, they're not monetizing it. And unless they come out with a replacement format like Eternal, they're not monetizing it in the future anyway. Bear in mind that even if a card does come off the reserve list, that doesn't mean it's getting reprinted. But anyway, uh, I say all of that largely just to say this. It, it's for the purpose of informing you, but it's also to encourage you, don't get depressed by these stories of buyouts and whatnot. Don't let the worst aspects of MTG Finance keep you from playing the game. MTG Finance can do beneficial things, of course, as uh, Corbin Hosler has actually spoken about in that very same article. Uh, and he actually leaves a, a number of links <laughs> to different ways that Magic the Gathering as a community has helped people out and what his goals are in MTG Finance. They're trying to get people into the game, not pricing people out, not just making a quick buck. So one recommendation that I have for you, give some other formats some love. Personally, I'm a big fan of Popper. <laughs> it's legacy light to a greater extent than modern is, I think. Modern feels very different to me, but in Popper, you get to play... I'm just going to start naming Blue, right? You get to play Brainstorm. You get to play Daze. You get to play Counterspell. You get to play Brainstorm! <laughs> I get to go Brainstorm, Fetch, Ponder... <laughs> okay, granted, your fetches are Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, but I get to do that when I play Turbo Fog, and I can see Burn Decks and... White weenie decks and control strategies. There are Tron decks. There are combo decks. It's a fun format. And that's just one. Uh, you can get into other f formats as well. I like Tiny Leaders. Giving that some love is pretty sweet. Although it does use some reserve list cards, potentially. They're in the pool. In any case, just find a format that you like and give it some love as well. But if you do want to play Legacy and Vintage, and I'm not going to lie, Legacy is my favorite format, Vintage is up there, for all those people that complain about them being these graveyards of turn one kill decks, play the format. You will very quickly see, if you play on a competitive enough level, which is to say pretty much anything other than the kitchen table, above the kitchen table I should say, it is not a turn one format. A lot of that has to do with Force of Will and Days, of course, but a lot of that has to do with just the sheer diversity, especially in Legacy, that you can find going from deck to deck to deck to deck. There are so many good ones. You can basically pick a deck that suits your personality. How many games can you say that about? Well, in any case, <laughs> if you want to play those formats, even without owning the cards themselves, do proxy them up. I'm encouraging you to proxy them up. Obviously, we can't play them at sanctioned events. That should go without saying, I suppose. But you can play in a, a casual playgroup, at the kitchen table. Uh, you can just go to your LGS. They can't sanction a tournament, but you can just hang out and play. Uh, when I lived in Athens, Devin Cox, uh, Thomas Dodd, you guys played Vintage with me, and I got so messed up.
<laughs> you guys are good. Some of the most competitive magic that I've ever played was against you guys. Certainly the most competitive EDH I've ever played was that Galactic Quest in Lawrenceville. Because they allowed proxies. And people could therefore optimize their decks. They could get whatever they wanted to into their decks. And I had people throwing out volcanic islands and tundras and bat or not badlands uh, plateau there we go uh, in the same deck even though they definitely could not you know they're they're high school kids they couldn't afford that and I got some of the toughest magic again that I've ever played from these guys and girls all right and also get into some budget brews and I don't just say that because, you know, you, you can't afford it, right? You can't afford Tarmogoyf, so you can't play Tarmogoyf. No, no, I mean, there's another good reason why I like it. It's because if you win with a budget deck, ooh, it can be even sweeter because of the uphill battle through which you had to slog to achieve victory. You know, it's one thing if you win with some, you know, $2,300 Jund deck. You know, it's one thing if you win with some... Esper Deathblade or something like that in Legacy. No, no, no. It's all the more, it's all the cooler when you can come in and win with, I don't know, you, you come in with Mono Green Infect, you come in with, uh, I'm trying to think of brews of mine that are pretty budget friendly, um, Mono Blue Infect, <laughs> you come in with Polymorph, you come in with, oh, uh, I don't know. There's some Tron lists that are pretty cheap still, actually. Uh, you bring whatever it is that you want to play. Uh, I have a Mono White Prison deck that's actually pretty cheap, and you can switch some cards out. It doesn't have to be the way that I build it. But the fundamentals of the deck are pretty solid, I think, and it will just outright beat certain decks. Oh, it's so sweet to be able to take out that Jund player, that Junk player, or Absin. Whatever these kids are calling it these days. Yeah, with a homebrew of yours. Anyway, th those are my two cents on the matter. I hope that you've enjoyed this vlog video of mine. I hope to have it up for you in the next couple of days. By the time you actually watch this, probably recorded a couple days ago, upload speeds are pretty terrible here in northeast Georgia. That's all right. And I hope, by the way, to get some new brews up pretty soon, uh, some new budget brews especially. I know that this, uh, this reprint issue is going to be a thing for the future, but if you do want to play Legacy, I have a deck for you. It's pretty budget friendly, at least as far as Legacy decks go, and it's competitive enough, I think, that you'll enjoy it. So with that being said, I will see you later. Take care, Magic Community on YouTube. T1 Glucinor Elf, signing off. Bye-bye.